I have no direction or goals in my life at the moment. What can I do to regain my compass in life? Well, you talked about that a little bit in your intro. So there's this line in the New Testament, which is kind of mysterious, you might say. But it's, a, it's really an instruction set. And the line is approximately, Knock and the door will open. Ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. And you think, well, no, no way, that can't possibly be true. But it's true if, if all of that is undertaken seriously. So one of the things... One of the things that Tammy and I learned to do when we were trying to adjudicate our arguments, and we both tried to abide by that, was like, if I'm upset with her, let's say, it's clearly because she's done something wrong. Um, <laughs> one of the things that I'm required to do is let her know what my conditions for satisfaction are. It's like, what do I want? And I have to be able to tell her. And I might object, well, if you loved me, dear, you'd know what I want. And people say that to each other all the time. And they should immediately get slapped for that. It's just like, <laughs> I'm too stupid to know what I want, let alone figure out what you want. You don't even know what you want. So, so it's good to kind of clue your partner in. Here's what I would... Now, that doesn't mean once you let the person know that they're necessarily going to deliver it, but they might especially if you also allow them the luxury of doing it stupidly and badly, at least to begin with. You know, you, you, your wife might tell you, when I put some effort into getting ready to go out, I'd like you to say something nice. It's still a bit vague. It's like, okay, dear, exactly what would you like me to say? Well, that, you know, that's an annoying thing for your wife to have to think through, but, and it's annoying for you maybe to have to mouth those words, but, you know... You, you could do it stupid and badly 20 times and maybe get a little expert at it. And by the hundredth time, you're like world expert at compliment deliverer. And <laughs> you can encourage her to pursue her interest in, in attire, let's say. And why isn't that a good thing for both of you? And so, but that's all dependent on whether or not you're willing to let yourself know what you want. And that's all dependent on whether or not you're willing to ask. And so one of the things you can ask yourself, and this is very useful, is what would your life have to look like in order for it to justify itself to you? And so why would I put it that way? Well, your life is hard. It's full of suffering. It's full of malevolence, for that matter. It's full of malevolent suffering. That's coming for sure. And that's a heavy burden to bear. And you might say, well, it's so heavy that nothing at all could possibly justify it. And I think that's not a productive attitude. I think if you watch your life, you see that there are things that will grip you that do appear to justify the weight of existence. And I think you can commune with yourself, which is a form of thought. It's a form of meditative prayer. But that's a form of thought and the thought is, what do I want? If I could have what I wanted and needed, what would that look like? And you might say, well, why would I associate thought with meditative prayer? It's like, well, what the hell do you think you're doing when you're thinking? If it isn't praying, it's the same thing. You, you first of all, you formulate a question. What do I want? And then you ask it. And you might say, well, who are you asking? Well, you're asking yourself. That would be the classic modern answer. It's like, well, if you're the person with the answer, why did you have to formulate the question? And so what are you doing when you formulate the question? And what you're doing, really, what you're doing is you're opening yourself up to revelation. And you might say, revelation from what? And that's a good question. No doubt about it. But in some sense, it's a revelation from the ground of being itself. You know, you ask yourself a question. If I could have what I needed and wanted, what would that look like? You'll get a dream. You'll get a vision. And it comes to you. That's the most accurate way of describing it. It makes itself manifest in the theater of your imagination. 
and, and in precise proportion to your willingness to actually formulate the question. It's a rather frightening question, you know, to, to, to find out, to allow yourself to ask yourself what it is that you really need and want because you simultaneously make the conditions for failure clear to yourself. And people like to keep that sort of thing foggy and vague so they don't have to hold themselves accountable. But that's a, a dreadful mistake. That's why I wrote rule three, do not hide unwanted things in the fog. It's like you should sharpen your aim. You should specify your goals. Now, the price that comes along with that is you'll know when you fail. But the advantage is you'll know when you fail. You can learn. During the season of Lent, we are called to abstain from luxuries and instead more deeply embrace our faith. Co-workers around the office have mentioned giving up coffee, alcohol, and social media. But how about using this time to start building a habit of prayer and meditation? Join me and thousands of others on Hallow, the number one Christian prayer app in the U.S., Hallow is helping me maintain a daily prayer routine from now until Easter, and it can help you too. Download the app for free at hallow.com slash Jordan. You can set prayer reminders and track your progress along the way. Not sure where to start? Check out Father Mike Schmitz's Bible in a Year, available on the Hallow app for brief daily Bible readings and reflections. Or pray alongside Mark Wahlberg, Jim Caviezel, and even some world-class athletes. With Hallow, you can customize a personal prayer plan that works for you and listen anywhere you are with downloadable offline sessions. Get an exclusive three-month free trial at hallow.com slash Jordan. That's hallow.com slash Jordan. Now, more practically, you don't know where you're going or why, the person who asked this question. So let's decompose the problem a little bit. I don't know what to do with my life. Well, that's a pretty vague problem because... Your life is, that's a big, complex, multi-dimensional thing, and the probability that you're going to be able to formulate an answer to the question, what's the meaning of my life, is pretty much zero. Because, well, what do you want, a one-sentence answer? Like, it's a one-sentence question. You think there's a one-sentence answer? That, that's not helpful. And so what I often did practically in my clinical practice, and this is useful, to know, especially if you're a bit lost, is, well, where do people derive, where do people generally derive their sense of meaning? And it's not that complicated to figure that out. And this is also a conservative perspective in some sense. Well, most people need or want an intimate relationship and some family interaction. Maybe that's children, maybe it's with your parents or your siblings, but Zero family interaction is generally not, not part of the optimized human condition. Most of us would like to have a friend or two. We need a job or a career to, to keep body and soul together, but also so that we have, so that we're in harness and we can pull against a weight that, that in a noble and productive and generous manner. We, perhaps need to be engaged in something creatively. We have to take care of ourselves mentally and physically. We should adopt some civic responsibility. We need to protect ourselves against major sources of hedonistic and impulsive temptation. There's eight things. It's like, well, pursue one of them. Start there. You know, when I dealt with my clients who were depressed, unhappy, let's say, the first thing I would do with them is walk them through that analytic process. It's like, do you have anything in place in any of these domains? Sometimes I had people who were doing pretty good in all eight areas and were still unhappy. Those people were depressed, technically, right? Because their lives were actually in pretty good order, but they were miserable. There was something wrong with them. They were ill in some way that was, was lowering their mood, and destroying their positive emotion. Other people would be batting zero on all eight fronts. Like, they weren't depressed, they just had terrible lives. And so, really, really, and so the, what I would do with those people is, well, look, like, here's eight things that aren't in place in your life. It's no bloody wonder you're miserable and everything seems meaningless except for the suffering, because that's a meaning too. It's like, why don't we start working incrementally in a few of these areas and then we can just evaluate and see if that's helpful, and it's almost invariably helpful. You know, and, and part, of that, part of that is, well, specify, you ask yourself, well, what, what 
do I need that I don't have? Well, maybe I'd like to have a partner. Okay, well, I can't just leap from not having a partner to being happily married in one fell swoop. There's intervening steps. One of the things I used to do with my clients who were lonesome is say, well, look, have you tried online dating? No, I'm too afraid. It's like, well, no wonder you're afraid of it. You have your reasons. But um, we could start small. It's like, why don't you write out a dating profile? Don't post it. Just go online one of these sites and write out a profile. Who are you? What do you have to offer? And what do you want? Think it through. Write it out. Come up with a coherent story about a coherent representation about who you are and then figure out what you want and see how that works we can play that through and then maybe when you develop that in a manner that feels solid to you and reliable and genuine and and you've also developed a vision of the person that you're trying to attract that would help you feel confident in your happiness if you actually met that person well then you're ready to go launch it on the site and talk to the person you know first maybe it's just text and then maybe it's coffee and you know there's incremental ways of doing this and you can do that with all of those eight domains it's like get yourself a life and if you have if you're firing on all cylinders in all eight dimensions and you're still depressed and this is a specific answer to the person formulating this question, if you're still unhappy, you should probably go see someone because you're probably sick. You know, if you've got all of those, if you have all that skill and you have all those relationships and activities in place and you still are suffering a, an excess of anxiety and pain and insufficient hope and motivation, it's highly probable that something, you know, that something's afflicting you that's in the nature of an illness. But if, you're, if you have none of those things, it's like, well, it's no wonder you're miserable. Misery is the default human condition in the absence of sustaining meaning, just like hunger is the default condition in the absence of, of food. And you need productive engagement, productive, generous, reciprocal engagement in order to provide you with the genuine meaning that sustains you in life. And the pathway, a lot of the pathway to that is, is pretty pragmatic and practical. You got no friends? That's likely a problem. You're a creative person, you have no creative outlet? That's not going to work out for you. No, you don't, you're lonesome because you don't have an intimate relationship? That's a source of pain. Those things have to be rectified and, and you can do that incrementally and that works. So. That's a practical pathway to incremental improvement. And one of the things that's cool about that, because you, you might be thinking, oh my God, this is hopeless. I don't have any of those eight things. I might as well just end it all tonight. It's like, and people certainly think that, you know, and I'm not making light of it. One of the things that's very much worth knowing is that a lot of positive emotion is dependent technically on the observation on your personal observation that you're moving towards a valued goal. See, not that you've attained the goal. So imagine that you're in your hopeless situation and you decide, well, I'm gonna work on, um, I'm gonna work on the relationship front. So now you develop a vision of what a relationship might be like and you posit that as a promised land, let's say. And then you differentiate that so you can make incremental steps forward and the incremental steps are small enough so that you actually take them. As soon as you start to take them and you observe yourself moving forward in relationship to that goal, then first of all, you'll be stabilized on the anxiety front because now you have a purpose that's finite and defined. And second, you have positive emotion because you experience positive emotion in relationship to observing yourself move towards a valued goal. So right away, you don't have to attain the goal in order to be meaningfully engaged. You just have to have to be on the pathway forward. And so you can benefit from this almost immediately. And if you want to do something practical, I have a program online at selfauthoring.com called Future Authoring that helps people develop a vision on these eight different dimensions, along these eight different dimensions that I just outlined. And 
you could go and do that, do it badly, because you're not going to get it perfect anyways, and then get humble enough to make the incremental steps small enough so someone as useless as you might actually do them, and then away you go. And that works out. We, we used this program, for example, among... For, we, we had students in three universities, but I'll talk about one, vocational college in Canada. We had all the students who were going to this vocational college. We divided them into two groups. They either wrote for 90 minutes about what they had done in the last two weeks in their life, or they wrote for 90 minutes about their vision across these dimensions that I described. They didn't have any training, no warning, except that they knew they were going to participate in the study, and no one even reviewed what they wrote. And we dropped the dropout rate of those students by 50% in the first year. All they needed was, all they needed, all, was a compelling vision, you know, and that's, that's what we all need. We all need a compelling vision. We're visionary creatures in, in, in the literal sense. We need a compelling vision, and one of the things our society does very badly is to encourage people, is to let people know that they are visionaries and to encourage them to develop for themselves a compelling vision. It's very sad that we don't do that. Especially because if you do do that with people, the results are spectacular and immediate. You know, and one of the things that's been heart-rending, I would say, for both of us, going around the world talking to people, is people frequently stop me on the street and, and say, the story is, in some, in some sense, archetypal, although the details vary in interesting ways. I wasn't in a very good place, I was suffering, and there's usually reasons for that. And then I listened to your lectures, which of course are predicated on the observations of brilliant clinicians and psychologists, and so aren't, the ideas aren't attributable to me, they're just great ideas. I listened to your lectures and I started developing a vision and attempting to put my life together and things are way better. It's like, what's so sad about, that's very, you know, that's, it's very pleasing to hear that in one sense, because the upside of the story is the improvement, right? The, the movement away from the catastrophe. But the downside of the story is twofold. First of all, the catastrophe was there to begin with. And second, it didn't take much encouragement to fix it, which brings the question right up to the forefront. Why the hell wasn't that encouragement there to begin with? Why are so many people dying on the vine for lack of an encouraging word? Because it's definitely the case. That pertains to the mental health of young people. And it's in no small part because we do everything we can to punish the spirit out of young people. We especially do that with boys. But we're pretty good at, you can't do that to boys without doing it to girls too in the fundament, in the final analysis because we're basically stuck with each other. So, develop a compelling vision and, and one that you're the one who judges whether or not it's compelling. You want a vision, you want a vision, you want to formulate a vision such that you, you apprehend the vision, you think, oh my God, if I could have that, life would be worth living. Well, yeah, that's what you want. And you might find that you're actually not that hard to satisfy. You know, that, that what would satisfy you, fill you with hope, stabilize you psychologically, is actually within your grasp. And certainly my experience on the clinical front was that that was the case. One of the things I loved about being a clinician, I really loved this, was that generally my clients who were genuinely aiming up, because not all of them were, but most of them were, the ones who were genuinely aiming up made rapid progress. And it was extremely engaging and entertaining to work with them on that. You know, we'd set goals. I want to triple my salary in three years. That was fun. It's like, okay, that sounds like a war. How might you do that? And it was extraordinarily entertaining to plot that out, to strategize about it like it was a full-fledged war. You know, but a war for something positive and a war that 
would benefit the person who won and also the people around them. And that's well within your grasp. There's any number of things that are right in front of you that you could radically improve with the right vision and that would result in radical improvement and not just for you but for everybody around you. That's just right there in front of everyone. And it's, it's, even, it's particularly true if what's around you is pretty dismal because if what's around you is pretty dismal, there's just no shortage of opportunity for improvement. Might be difficult, but man, there's lots of possibilities sitting there as well. So, aim up. Get a vision, man, and pursue it. And the more of us that do that, the better things are going to be. And it would be better if they were better than if they were worse. And we're certainly trying to sort that out on the cultural front at the moment. It's like, let's aim up, eh? Because down is very deep hole. And maybe we don't want to blunder into that again.